Welcome to Darien Library. Thank you for coming out this evening. My name is Erin Shea. I'm the head of adult programming here. I would just like to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make events like these possible. Uh, tonight's event is also sponsored by the Darien Rowayton Bank. So thank you so much to the Dar Darien Rowayton Bank for making tonight possible. They were also sponsors of our annual gala fundraiser. We're very grateful to them. Tonight's guest is one of Darien's own, and he has spoken at Darien Library before, but never in this new building, which we still refer to as new, even though it's been here five years now. Uh, so we're very excited to have him here for the first time to talk about one of his books. Tonight he's here to talk about his latest work, Hell Before Breakfast, a book that celebrates America's forgotten war correspondence. These men were legends in their time. Between 1860 and 1910, between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War, when empires fell and dynasties flourished, these men led romantic, thrilling lives on the edgiest frontiers of time and place, seeing the world, breaking the stories, and making news themselves. Please join me in welcoming to Darien Library the acclaimed author of The Pattons and Patriot Pirates, Mr. Robert Patton. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you a lot. Uh, I know I'm not alone here in appreciating this amazing resource that we have in the Darien Library and all its staff. Uh, Lord knows I've leaned on them plenty for the research I've done and uh, I just want to say to them that are here now, thank you so much for what you did to help me, and uh, thank you for inviting me tonight. And now, to all you folks that are here, and there are a few familiar faces, I've got to say. I see some friends, I see high school classmates, I see acquaintances, I see friends of friends. If I do well tonight, maybe there'll be some new friends. Uh, that's always nice. Uh, and I just am very touched to see each and every one of you, and uh, hope that we have a nice chat about this strangely titled book I wrote. Uh, hell Before Breakfast. Uh, not long ago, I sent a copy of it to a friend of mine who's a very great reader of histories and novels, and he, he sent back his comments, and I like to think that they were as uh, honest as they were polite. Uh, and the last thing he said was, while he was reading it, he would uh, got the impression that I had thoroughly enjoyed every moment of writing it. Thoroughly enjoyed every moment. Well, I know he meant that as a compliment, uh, but really my first reaction was, are you nuts? Because, because writing is hard for most writers, it's certainly hard for me, and it was particularly difficult in this case because uh, I really wanted it to read exactly that way, as if it had been produced in some kind of sustained burst of inspiration. That had been one aim that I wanted to start with. Uh, another aim, even before I Oh, in fact, as I think of it, there's a correspondent in my book that sort of captures it exactly right. He comes in exhausted from the battlefield one day, and he sits down at his camp table, and he puts a, a pot of uh, hot black Turkish coffee on one corner, and he puts a big bottle of champagne on the other corner of the table, guzzles the champagne, swigs down the coffee, and on that fuel, he then proceeds to blast out 2,000 words for the International Telegraph. Well, that's what I wanted my book to read like. Um, <laughs> as I began it, at least that was the aim. Even before I began it, I had the aim of at least concentrating in a way that perhaps I hadn't done in my earlier, my last book, on character and on people. Uh, really, rather than uh, begin sort of with the large canvas, I said, let's, in this, in this instance, begin with uh, a portrait, a group portrait, as it turned out. Uh, and so that became, again, my, my motivating uh, aim as I began to conceive this, this project. But who? Who was I going to write about? What was the character that would be the basis of, of the story? Well, it just so happened, in my office at home, I had this book on my shelf. It's called Eyewitness to History. I highly recommend it to everybody. It's a paperback uh, published in 1987, uh, edited by a guy named John Carey. And what it is, it's full of these very brief eyewitness accounts of uh, events great and small from throughout history. It might be a plague, it might be a, a medieval fair, it might be a hanging, it might be a scientific discovery, whether it was George Orwell writing about something or whether it was Matthew Arnold uh, writing about something in, in his period of England. They're wonderful, you can dip in and out of it and this just happened to be by chance uh, on my shelf uh, ready for me to, to take down and flip through. And wouldn't you know, as I'm thinking about what I'm gonna write, I open it up and this is what I hit upon. The excerpt was called 
the Turkish atrocities in Bulgaria in August 1876. The Turkish atrocities in Bulgaria, written by one J. A. McGahan of the London Daily News. Now reading it, it is a heartbreaking and very, very graphic account of the slaughter of thousands of Bulgarian Christians, uh, Christian villagers at the hands of Muslim militia who are working for the Ottoman Empire, that is Turkey, in 1876, and Turkey at that time possessed the territory of Bulgaria. Well, beyond that, I found out that the writer, January Aloysius McGahan, was a 32-year-old American. And at the time, he was the most renowned foreign correspondent in the world. What's more, his reports of these Bulgarian massacres ignited a war, a war between Russia and Turkey fought in Bulgaria that in less than a year killed more than 300,000 soldiers and civilians. Now, we think of Muslim and Christian, and I mean, we've all heard way too much about it in recent years. Uh, but I think it's worth remembering that in this case, the Muslim death squads, which is what they were, were comprised of refugees driven into Bulgaria from their homeland across the Black Sea in what is today southernmost Russia. Think Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea, which now we know is part of southernmost Russia. Uh, and these Muslim Circassians had fled a brutal Russian conquest, Russian Christians, let's note, that had displaced or annihilated more than a half a million of them. So in other words, McGahan's Bulgarian discoveries were just part of a cycle of ongoing, vicious, sectarian violence that had been going on for decades and even centuries. Grim, terrible stuff, but kind of a good story. So I discover that McGahan's an American. I discover that he's famous around the world. And I discover that his reports in 1876 start a terrible, terrible war, and all because this Ohio-born adventure seeker happened to chase down some rumors of trouble in the Balkan mountains of Bulgaria. Well, I'm embarrassed to say I knew none of this, but I had a hunch that a lot of other people didn't know much about it either. So there, I thought, is my new book. Piece of cake. It'll write itself. Be done in a year. Mini series to follow. I'm all set. <laughs> well, lo, these five plus years later, uh, that when it's done, I, 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 I did always stay focused on that original aim of the human element, of McGahan, the editors, the colleagues, the wives, lovers, competitors, that made up this brotherhood of journalists that crisscrossed Europe and Central Asia in the second half of the 1800s. But still, that history uh, that I sort of wanted to put secondary to the story of the folks loomed. It almost became a, a large character that had to be acknowledged, had to be incorporated. Uh, and because the history was simply so huge in that period, uh, in fact, one of the American reporters, when he's first going over there, he's quite intimidated. He, he says, what's going on there are, to me, like events in an ancient world. It's remote as the wars between Athens and Sparta 2,000 years ago. And to be honest, that period wasn't much more familiar to me. So on the hunch that maybe it's not that familiar to a lot of, of other folks, and possibly to you either, I'm going to hesitate before I get into the good stuff, the characters and what they did, and mainly what they wrote. I want to give you a little bit of the historical background, sort of the arc. So as I wander into anecdote and whatever irrational spaces I may find myself, we'll, we can get back to this, this timeline, because the story does sort of follow an arc of events. So let's start with America and its newspapers. In the decade before the Civil War, our telegraph system expanded from 2,000 to 30,000 miles of cable. Another 15,000 was added during the war, mostly by the military. So America was wired. News, information traveled coast to coast, no problem. But you could not still get information from Europe in less than three weeks or maybe two at the best. It came only by ship. There was no way to get a, a telegraphic communication across the ocean. Three newspapers dominated the American culture. The New York Times, the New York Tribune, and the New York Herald. The Times, and especially the Tri Tribune, were liberal, Republican, they went together in those days, strongly anti-slavery and strongly pro-Lincoln. The Herald was by far the most popular of the three, and it was the opposite on all counts. In its pages, Lincoln was a blithering fool. Uh, abolitionists were uh, self-righteous kooks, and the South was better left to secede and keep its slavery, its peculiar institution, as it was called, rather than unleash what the Herald 
said would be oceans of blood required to keep the Union together. And indeed, it did take oceans of blood, as we all know. Well, during that war, predictably, the circulations of these three newspapers went up. Nothing sells like war news, one of the editors said. But when the fighting ended, the circulation dipped, even as America was undergoing this huge post-war expansion where you had industry, urban populations, literacy, and the number of newspapers increasing greatly across the country. And yet, regrettably, from a strictly sales point of view, there's no war to really excite and bring in new readers. At the same time, this is the American beginning of our Gilded Age, right? It's the Civil War. American interest starts to boom in tourism and in foreign affairs. Perfect example, Mark Twain's first big bestseller, The Innocents Abroad, which was um, a, a satire uh, of American tourism. And the, this, this fashion, which is what it was, was observed by a very young editor. His name was John Russell Young. I'll tell you his name again later. Don't worry. He's only 25 years old. And he had the hunch that maybe there was going to be news in Europe as well as just um, a, sort of a, a phenomenon of American tourists going there. So he had the foresight to send a veteran, grizzled Civil War combat reporter named George W. Smalley abroad for Young's paper, The Tribune, to be what was called the European Special, the dedicated correspondent for European affairs, first of his kind ever. And then in the same summer, 1866, George Smalley's on a vessel going across to his, his big job in, in Europe. And this happens. The transatlantic telegraph cable, after years of expensive failure, is finally laid and connected across the Atlantic floor. And it links North America and Europe. And now you can get news from Europe in a few minutes rather than three weeks. And then the last piece of the puzzle, the European continent is about to oblige sensation-hungry American newspapers with a succession, a 12-year succession of brief but unbelievably bloody imperial wars in which European monarchies sort of jockeyed for power and territory. And what it meant was that for the Americans, war news in America, albeit from Europe, fresh war news was back. <laughs> now, I always stop here as I'm talking because I, 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 I become uh, so almost self-conscious of the idea that people think, oh my god, this book must be one just lurid carnival of barbaric bloodshed. And, and it, it's got a lot of that. If you like that, I, I'm here to provide. But um, uh, it, it also has, um, I got to say, it's got the, the yacht races and duels and love affairs and scientific explorations. You've got the Stanley Livingston expedition. The, uh, Stanley was sponsored by the New York Herald. And that's right in the heart of this era. Uh, there are a number of terrific walk-ons because they were friends. Uh, particularly the editors uh, that I talk about, Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, Ulysses Grant, Walt Whitman, all figure in the story. But obviously I'm concentrating on these war correspondents and war was their business, it was their fascination, and yes indeed it was their compulsion as well. So what were the wars? They are the pillars of the book, so I'll give them to you as briefly as I can. The Austro-Prussian War, Austria against Prussia. It lasts seven weeks in 1866. In those seven weeks, 100,000 people are killed or wounded. And Prussia is left at the top of the European power structure under Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck. Four years later, 1870, Franco-Prussian War, France against Prussia. Again, instigated by Bismarck, who wanted French wealth and territory, which he got at the cost of 200,000 soldiers and civilians dead in six months. France, after this defeat, now undergoes a civil war of its own. What happens briefly is left-leaning, largely socialist Paris resents the drift back to monarchy that the French people as a whole start to support after the war ends. So Paris rebels. It sets up an armed perimeter and declares itself an autonomous city-state within greater France. This is a, um, a socialist commune. It's known in history as the Paris Commune. Well, the French government cannot accept this, and it uh, commences a two-month siege of its own capital that ends with a week of house-to-house -house fighting known today as Bloody Week, in which about 800 French government soldiers are killed in that week, and about 25,000 Parisian communists, members of the commune. And at this point, American correspondents, whom we've met earlier in the story, are now all over it. They lead the world in covering this. Now, there's a period in my book where the action kind of shifts to Central Asia and Russian conquest. And then finally, there is our, our third great war in the book, which is the longest, all of eight months. And it's also the bloodiest, and it's the one between Turkey 
and uh, Russia that was instigated by the uh, reports uh, of J.A. McGahan, the American. Why did those reports have, have this effect? Well, basically Britain had huge colonial interests, as we all know, in India at the time, and Russia wanted to insert itself, intrude itself, into the uh, trade routes between India and Great Britain. This was the basis of the so-called great game that Britain and Russia uh, uh, played geopolitically uh, uh, through military maneuvering and, and all sorts of other tricks uh, uh, of politics in most of the 1800s, the great game. You've probably all heard the term. Part of this great game meant that Britain and Turkey were allies. They were uneasy allies, but they were allies. So whenever Russia sort of tried to do an end run to the north and come down through Romania into Bulgaria and the Balkans, it hesitated because to do that would have taken on Turkey and Britain because Britain was an ally. But when McGahn's reports were, were published about these atrocities, Muslim against Christian, in Bulgaria, when they appeared in London in 1876, the British people were so appalled by Turkish behavior, what they construed sort of as applying to all Turks everywhere, meant that the British government could not defend them, could not stand in as an ally. So they had to step back and watch from the sidelines as Russia went to work and did what it had wanted to do for a long time anyway, which was to save the Bulgarian Christians. Yeah, a little, mostly just acquire Bulgaria. That's what it was about. Russia wanted Bulgaria and took its chance once these reports came out. So you've been very patient. That's the history lesson. Let's get to a couple of the characters and uh, hear what their voices are like. George W. Smalley, Massachusetts born, tough as nails. He ultimately became, as I said, first the dedicated special in Europe, and then he became the Tribune's foreign bureau chief. Again, there had been no such thing before. He was the first. He made his name in the Civil War, and he authored the war's most famous battlefield dispatch from the Battle of Antietam, fought at Sharpsburg, Maryland, bleh, Sharpsburg, Maryland in September 1862. What made his story such a great beat, as it was called, and the beat term comes from beating the other guy. It, it, you got the exclusive. You beat the competition. You got the exclusive and brought it back, and it could be sold on a street corner. He wrote the story of the battle and interpreted it correctly, because most that were there thought it was initially a Union triumph that had broken the back of the Confederacy and was a great testament to the wonderful generalship of George McClellan. And anybody that knows Civil War history knows now that George McClellan was one of the war's most inept commanders. Well, this was missed by most of the reporters there. It was not missed by George Smalley. And here's what he had to say. Fierce and desperate battle between 200,000 men has raged since daylight, his Antietam dispatch begins. Yet night closes in on an uncertain field. Now the first day left the Union at a slight advantage and everything seemed favorable, Smalley writes, for a, a renewal of the fight to the Union advantage the next afternoon. But matters quickly change. When McClellan's field commanders implore him to call up a reserve of 15,000 fresh troops. Smalley's nearby, he's sitting on horseback, he's listening to the staff meeting. He realizes, and now this is his voice, the moment has come when everything may turn on one order, given or withheld, when the history of the battle is only to be written in the thoughts and purposes and words of one general. Time seems to stop while McClellan ponders. At length he sighs, gazes at the western sky, and says, there's nothing more I can do. Smalley writes at the end, men had died by hundreds and were yet to die because he could not make up his mind. That's in his story. His boss later was John Russell Young, seven years younger than Smalley. Now, Young had a little bit of a taste of war reporting in 1861. He was the first, at age 20, reporter to get the Battle of Bull Run right for the Philadelphia Press. He called it as a Union defeat right away, and of course it had been misinterpreted initially. After that little taste, he always had a sense that he wanted to get back, and he said to, to, to have a, one more hairbreadth escape under fire. This was very attractive to him. Uh, so, but he was elevated to an editor, a managing editor of the Tribune, and yet this continued, this little fantasy continued to nag. And when the Paris Commune rebelled from Greater France in 1871, that was his chance. He packed his bags and went to Paris to be basically a tourist in a city under siege. Why not? He's a, he's a former war reporter. That was fun to him, and off he went. One of the things that happened uh, at the commune, uh, the, uh, there's a, there was a great 144-foot tall column to the honor of Napoleon at Place Vendôme. And it was wrapped uh, with, these, uh, with these iron bas-reliefs celebrating Napoleon's victories uh, made from the melted-down cannon 
of Napoleon's vanquished adversaries. Well, the commune deems this a symbol of brute force and false glory and decides to haul it down. Now, world opinion, when it hears this, condemns this as just a desecration of French grandeur and French heritage, and how can you do this? Young, who watched the thing come crashing down, had a somewhat different view, and here's what he said. He writes, is there really nothing better for a nation as great as France than to send her sons out to murder and devastation, and when the work is over, to build a monument to assassination and misery and woe? Napoleon was a grand figure, yes. He knew his people's ways and whims, when to give them music, when to give them grape shot. And the column was an impressive work of art. But today, a people have been brave enough to root out a monument to murder and say the time has come to do what statecraft has failed to do, namely to live in the world which God sent them to occupy without, of necessity, cutting their neighbor's throat. That's his article about what he saw. Well, Young would see a whole lot of throat cutting and a whole lot of killing in those last days of the commune. Uh, in fact, he would later say, uh, reflecting on the previous century's uh, French Revolution, he said, I now understand what was meant by the reign of terror. Uh, there was fighting in the streets. There are these uh, sort of these last stands and buildings and cemeteries. And as I say, there are these, uh, these mass executions of, the, of the, uh, the communards, the communists. And Young was there to record all of it. But no reporter had a closer view of what happened to the commune or more deeply identified with it than our American Januarius McGahan, J.A. McGahan, the Ohioan. Still in his 20s, he'd been wandering Europe trying to write a great novel when the New York Herald at the start of that war between France and Prussia had snatched him up to be a reporter because he was very good at language. That was his only credential. He ends up living inside Paris during this entire siege and consequently, he can't help but become sympathetic to the people and what they're undergoing. And of course, he's outraged in a very heartfelt way by their destruction. And this kind of passion is McGahan's real gift as a reporter. They all, have, they all bring certain styles to the table. That's his. He's all heart. It's, it's on his sleeve. In fact, one editor complains at one point later. He says, his, 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 too many opinions in his stories, not enough facts. But that's, that's, that's who he was. As a boy, he was known for taking on bullies if they menaced his friends. And his reporting always supported uh, the victim, uh, uh, the downtrodden, the underdog. His politics were kind of diffuse and unclear, but it was always, if someone was in trouble, he would side with the, well, who, the, the, the weaker side, whoever that seemed to be. Interestingly, colleagues loved him. He was the top of the heap. He was the main man, finally, but he helped everybody. Anyone that needed a hand up in their career, he was the first to do it. These passions were many. He was passionate about politics. He said his experience of seeing the commune shattered changed him from being simply a liberal to being, yes, a communist. He was passionate about journalism. I've made up my mind, he said, to tell the truth no matter how much it may seem against religion or order, and I don't care if they shoot me for it. He wrote that in his 20s. And he was romantic about women. He fell in love with just about everyone that he met, and he was very candid, even in these years, about pursuing sex with as many of them as possible. Whether with his very beautiful Russian wife, any number of brown-skinned maidens he encountered on expeditions to Central Asia or inside the Arctic Circle, and at least possibly with an English Viscountess uh, who was doing charity work in the Balkans at the time he was doing his investigations of uh, uh, the, uh, the militia activities of the Turks. <coughs> A Russian diplomat from the Tsar's court in St. Petersburg said he never saw anyone, much less a low-born American, mixed with Russian nobility uh, with such sort of easy familiarity. He bantered with grand dukes. He flirted with their wives, this man said. As the diplomat put it, McGahan's jocular swagger somehow allowed him to keep a fine line between charm and impertinence. McGahan's fame grew in 1874. This is, that would be three years after the commune. He's now very famous when he published a best-selling book about covering the Russian conquest of Kiva, which is in today's Uzbekistan. And the climax of that tale occurs when he rides with a force of Russian Cossacks uh, against a horde of fleeing natives. They're called Turkomans. And it is a very one-sided affair, and I'll let McGahan tell you about it. The carnage was awful. Everywhere were bodies bloody and ghastly. Worse was the sight of women and children watching while swarming Cossacks finished off their husbands, sons, and fathers. Surveying the smoldering battlefield, McGain became expert in the demeanors of children who'd just seen their parents killed. Some gave wrenching sobs, some looked merely bewildered, and some watched the ongoing pillage with placid curiosity. <laughs> 
Moving out afterward with the Russian troops, McGahan took in a last sight. Three Turkmen adults lay dead on the ground. Six children, alive, were nearby. The eldest, only about eight years old, was already engaged in making up a bed for his siblings under a cart with bits of cotton and worn out rugs, all that was left of their home. McGahan goes over and offers money to the child. The boy, this eight-year-old, throws the money back in McGahan's face. And here's what McGahan said. I have no doubt his little heart swelled with rage at the sight of me. Twenty years hence, some white men will probably feel how well he learned to hate them. And indeed, McGahan saw the fruits of that hatred, that kind of hatred, in those Bulgarian mountains in 1876. And he wrote those descriptions of terrible mass killing and mass rape, which was particularly shocking to Victorian England, that happened there with the specific intention of starting a war between Russia and Turkey by giving Russia the means, by getting Britain to stand on the sidelines, to go in there and avenge what McGahan had seen. That's what motivated him. Those were his passions. And we know he succeeded, and it was a dreadful war. Now, on a somewhat lighter note, I'll tell you about another of his passions. He loves colorful, charismatic characters. In fact, he sometimes would let his politics slide if there was someone who was just really cool. He just thought he was so great. It didn't matter if he was a fascist. He still liked him. And, and one of the best examples of that is, is a man named Mikhail Skobolev. Skobolev, at 33, is the youngest Russian general in the war against the Turks that began in 1877. He eventually, and his story, history names him so, is that war's greatest general at 33. And he becomes world famous in McGain's dispatches. Now, a few things about Mikhail Skobolev. He led from the front rank. He always wore a bright white uniform and rode a white or gray horse because he wanted first to be seen by the enemy and he wanted to be seen by his men. He wanted them to know where they were supposed to go. They would follow his white uniform. Interestingly, initially in the war, he rode at the head of a regiment of Muslim Cossacks. And his fellow generals did not want these sort of sinister, motley uh, 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 riders, these Cossacks, these Muslims, uh, uh, in their commands because they, number one, thought they were just so disreputable, but also thought they would hesitate in killing their co-religionists uh, among the Muslim Turks. Under Skobolev, that proved not to be a problem. Um, he, uh, he lauded them and praised them. He said they're cheerful, they're brave, and what I like best, they're merciless. So he's really your classic cold-blooded, hot-blooded, battlefield cavalier. You could think Hotspur, you could think Custer, you could think Jeb Stuart, and you could even think of that guy Patton. That's the kind of man he was. As one reporter said, it would be embarrassing if every general were a Skobolev, but a few scattered through an army are of real value in warfare. And Skobolev indeed was valuable. Going into the war, his reputation is dirt. And we see the effect of this through McGahan's eyes early on. After the very first battle of the war, which Skobolev basically won single-handedly, the Tsar comes down to the theater of action to give medals out to all the generals. This is sort of a great Russian tradition. And it's very emotional. And the Tsar goes down the parade ground, and he's hugging each officer. And they're having a great uh, sort of a moment of gusto between them. And, and Skobolev is waiting with his motley group down, and down, down at the end. And here we take up the story. The Tsar paused when he came to the blonde, bearded Skobolev. Well known as a womanizer, a drunk, and a possible thief, the young general had lately added to his disrepute by marrying a girl from an esteemed family in Moscow. She'd run home in tears 14 days after the wedding. Her parents were outraged and ashamed till she described her husband's vile desires that had compelled her to flee, after which they forgave her with open arms. No one ever divulged the details uh, which had you know, caused her disgust in her husband. Not even Skobolev, who only shrugged to his friends that in all honesty, he couldn't blame the girl one bit. <laughs> it's true. Now the Tsar knew all about the scandal. Would he now overlook his distaste or would he reward Skobolev's battlefield heroics? He would not. As I write in the book, the Tsar walked on. No embrace, no medal, his back already turned as Skobolev bowed respectfully after him. The episode confirmed what a Russian prince had earlier told McGahan. Skobolev is an officer with whom in peace no one would shake hands. But McGahan from that point on saw it another way. It was a flagrant insult he wrote in the very face of the entire army, but Skobolev took it in proud silence that seemed to me very grand. Now it wouldn't be long until the Tsar completely changes his tune on Skobolev and gives him a command of a huge army. Uh, and at that point, McGahan has 
in, in, in devotion to the general, and it's mutual, has made him a star in his reports. So this leads it to the other reporters to make the case that young Skobolev, while indeed a phenomenal warrior, is quite insane. <laughs> and now I will introduce a very last character, and, and maybe we, had, we can wind this up and we can ask questions if you're so moved. And this one, this fellow enters somewhat late, but I really think he provides the emotional spine to the story as I, the story that I tried to tell anyway. He's four years younger than, than, uh, than McGahan. His name is Francis Davis Millet, and he's from Massachusetts. And he is a blue blood, a Boston blue blood with heritage all the way back to the Mayflower. He's studying in Paris, uh, painting uh, in 1877, just as the uh, Russo-Turkish War is getting, you know, sort of getting um, off the ground. It hasn't begun yet, but the, the forces are gathering. And his career, which eventually would make him world famous around the world, his, his paintings are in New York, they're, they're, they're exhibited everywhere, uh, it, it had a dry patch. So what does a young painter do when he's having trouble painting? At least in those days, if you're Frank Millet, you go become a war correspondent for the New York Herald and run off to, to Romania to join the, the uh, mustering, massing Russian army. He's, got a, he's a great character. He's very modern. He's very graceful. He's dry-witted. He's ironic. He's self-effacing. He is also gay, which is neither here nor there in my book, but I think it's interesting. And he wrote his friends in Paris on the eve, right when the, eve, uh, the invasion is about to start. He goes, I am quite warlike now. You wouldn't know me. What fun I'm having. Well, his early combat dispatches are actually pretty funny because this is part of the way he is. He basically apologizes to readers for having no clue as to what's going on in the battle because basically he's scared out of his mind. And he says that to the readers in the first sentence of, of, of his first few, uh, few pieces. But he toughens up very fast, and a couple of months into the fighting, he wrote a friend, Mark Twain, whose painting he's actually done about a year earlier. And the letter he sent to Twain uh, conveys the fact that the war is clearly not that much fun anymore. This diabolical war, everything has been mismanaged to a criminal extent. Imbecility reigns. The poor patient soldiers, the devoted officers of the line, the gallant colonels and brigadiers have to go up and be slaughtered because a stupid major general is taking his tea in the middle of the day and has given the order without the very slightest idea of the state of affairs. It is too much for human patience to stand. I fear I should go mad. Frank Millet doesn't go mad. He sticks with the job for the duration of the war. He's one of only two correspondents from an original group of 80 that make it all the way through, and the other one is the Ohioan J.A. McGahan. Two guys make it through, and they're the only ones standing in the whole core of correspondence at the end of the war. Their bond, as a result, is profound. Now, Millet, as I said, wrote for the New York Herald. McGahan initially wrote for the Herald, had switched over to the, to the Daily News of London, but during that war, those two papers formed a business partnership, so their pieces appeared jointly in both the, uh, the New York Herald and the London Daily News. In other words, they're, they're appearing in what was basically the world. In the last month of the war, when both of the armies that they've been covering are just shot beyond belief, they're exhausted. The fighting just devolves through the winter, terrible winter weather to just miserable mutual reprisals on POWs, staggering army remnants, civilian refugees, of course. And, and the two Americans at this point are writing their pieces jointly, actually sitting down and writing them together. And these pieces are very powerful, in my opinion. Most of all, in their amazingly heartfelt regard for common soldiers from both armies. This is the interesting thing that enters into these pieces, which are normally so partisan. They went into the war impelled by the noblest of purposes, Millet and McGahan write in these joint dispatches, ignorant of the diplomatic tricks and unscrupulous devices of politicians. They have no poets to tell their noble deeds and unparalleled endurance. I really would submit to anyone that I think in Millet and McGahan's joint dispatches, which are gathered in these huge volumes of, of the correspondence of the Daily News and the Herald, which can be read by anyone, these forgotten soldiers in this basically forgotten war do have their poets and do have their honorable commemoration. Uh, I truly believe it. Now, after this cataclysm, these, these years of war in Europe, uh, the, the land is saturated in blood and the people are sick of death and dying. And Europe enters its belle epoque, its end of century period of joyful living when art, science, and culture flourish. Our reporters, for the most part, are burned out or dead. Um, but their reports, I think, if you step back and, and see the effect of them, remember, they appear throughout Europe and America. They truly created that proverbial image of the war correspondent as daring and dashing and sort of tragically, romantically doomed. It's an image that I think undoubtedly influenced adolescents and teenagers who would have read those stories and thrilled at their drama 
uh, while at the same time, because they were adolescents and teenagers, not quite um, uh, getting the fact that these are horrors that are being put, for, put forward in these tales. And who were boys and teenagers at that time? Well, I'll give you three. Winston Churchill, Rudyard Kipling, and Theodore Roosevelt. They were exactly the type of character that would have read that stuff, and we understand uh, how it would have affected all three characters. So in closing, I just want to mention something I only recently came across. I think it's kind of an interesting perspective. Probably a lot of you uh, know, or know of Sebastian Junger. He wrote A Perfect Storm. He's a very eminent war correspondent in his own right. He did a film documentary recently on the life and career of his friend, the photojournalist Tim Hetherington, who was killed in Libya in 2011. And in that uh, documentary, Junger makes, I think, a very striking observation. He says that in war, a person has to process the fact that he or she might be killed, that the possibility of losing one's life is always present. But what is certain, Junger says, is that sooner or later, you absolutely will lose a friend. And until that happens, you really don't know the full truth of war. Well, going back to our reporters, it would be, of all things, the rookie, Frank Millett, rather than the veteran McGahan who would learn that last hard lesson. For it would be McGahan who would not return alive from Turkey. For the rest of his life, Millett, who did a lot of writing, in addition to all his, his, his painting, did a lot of writing, a lot of lecturing about this war, he always ended up with a um, uh, a characterization, a eulogy, a lament for his late friend. Those of us who are fortunate enough to know him intimately, Millet said of McGahan, will never resign ourselves to his loss. Frank Millet, just to wind it up, Frank Millet died in 1912. He and his longtime companion, an army major, booked passage on the Titanic and went down with that ship in the North Atlantic. This is the amazing part to me. We have eyewitness accounts of both men Millet and his companion, behaving with unbelievable grace and courage through this obviously trying night. They're helping passengers into the lifeboats. Millet was very good in languages. He had experience, obviously, uh, in, in Eastern Europe. And he helped uh, uh, immigrants that were down in steerage from there, uh, you know, as best he could with his language, get into, you know, get through the procedures of, of getting off the vessel. Behaved unbelievable. And then we even have this, one of the last gentlemen that jumped off into the, into the water said later that he saw Millet and his companion having a drink together in the stateroom of the Titanic as the deck was beginning its last steep, precipitous tilt into the sea. That's our last vision of Frank Millet on the planet. Pretty good. Later, a friend of Millet's, J. M. Bar Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, spoke of his friend in a letter. And here's what he said. Brave and true and loyal. He was a man one would choose to be on a liner with when it was going down. No. It's a very curious description, and I hear people chuckling because I have the same reaction, but it's a terrific thing to say about someone, I think. I mean, think about it. If you're going to go down to your doom in the North Atlantic on a sinking ship, Frank Millett's the kind of guy you want with you. Could there be anything better said about a human being, a better epitaph? Well, I'm just going to wind up and say that for me, I think this book is full of people like that. And it was, it was a, a revelation, it was a, a, a joy, and it, I actually consider it an honor to have written about them. And I like to think that anyone that is uh, curious about them will have the same reaction on reading about them. So that's my story. I hope you all uh, didn't go too long, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the book uh, if, you, if you have any. Uh, anyone? Yes? How did you come up with it? The title. The title is um, William Sherman, of the great Civil War general of the March on Atlanta, hated reporters. And he heard one day that several had been killed in action. And his very first impulsive reaction was, great, now we will have news from hell before breakfast. And thus the title. Um, I went through some other titles. Uh, they were not, not as, uh, maybe not as catchy, but I, one was called that I, I was very favorable to. It was called Monster Picnic. And that was from a phrase in, in a dispatch uh, from Frank Millet, who uh, there was at one point there was a siege of, 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 of uh, Turkish forces were trapped, and the uh, Russian forces had surrounded it and were basically, couldn't, they couldn't take it, so they were starving it out. And there, there's this period of waiting, and Millet writes, he said, we reporters are engaged in a monster picnic. We're having a good time. There are, there's wine. There's free time. We're just waiting. Uh, we've sealed them off. It's a great picnic for us. A few miles away, monstrosities are occurring. Uh, 40,000 Turks are starving to death. 
And that was sort of the, the take he had, and I, and I liked the balance of the story because there is, they like their work, these guys, but on the other hand, they aren't, they couldn't help but have their eyes open to the horrors that they see, and they really do see dreadful, dreadful things. Um, these are, some of these wars, these numbers, they're almost abstract. You can't really get in, you know, 300,000 people in nine months. What could that mean? Well, that's basically Gettysburg and Antietam and Shiloh just week after week. You know, they keep coming because it's, it's just old time tactics of, of great phalanxes of marching men going across golf fairways into hurricanes of metal from the other side. And that's what, that's what these wars were like. Yes? Bob, the, um, you know, the, Communication means that these folks had was you know first uh, you know physical getting on a ship and taking a three week voyage, then very slow telegraphy. Um, it makes me wonder, and I'd like to know what your opinion is of now with today the access to instantaneous video bandwidth a go go between here and Europe and anywhere else in the world. Um, are we better off or worse considering that you know we see. Um, as much coverage of that idiot from the LA Clippers on TV as we do about Putin outside the, outside the Ukraine. Do you think it's we're better off? Or yeah, I, you know, I guess I think we've all sort of. I like to think we've all gotten wiser as the technology's gotten better, and you, I think we have to understand that this footage is raw. And a, a really good example: if if we see something on a video. You know, some, some horror in some town square uh, in the in the in the Middle East where some bombs gone off, and you see this, and 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 as as McGahan did, all, all he sees is the victims of the Turks, and for the, the, much of the, his motivation in the war is just the Turks can do no good. Millet happens to see the most horrific thing that the Russians do, which is the it's somewhat inadvertent, but it's inadvertent out of willful negligence, um, uh, the burial alive of Turkish prisoners who are wounded. Millet sees this, and he says, the, the Russians are barbaric, and he starts to become very sympathetic to the other side, which makes, when they write jointly, a very sort of a beautiful hybrid, because they sort of have to come to terms with these, these, these uh, diametrically opposed perceptions. So what, what, in answer to your question, I just think, and I, I have no more insight really into that than you, but when I watch it, I try to say, let's be wise. I'm seeing raw footage, and you've got this, this guy out in the West. He, he, he got, got taped, and these were awful things he said, and he's going to have to pay the price, because the public got a hold of it, and then he, he runs an institution which depends on the, the public coming to see it. And that's that. Um, and what we see coming from you know, these unedited things coming from uh, other, other areas, we just have to be smart. The technology brings it really, really uh, uh, brutally and fresh. You have to have some perspective sometimes. I mean, what did they say if there had been cameras on the D-Day beach, so we, the Americans would have demanded an end to the war right, that, right then. Uh, it, was, it was so horrible for those that were there. So uh, you know, we're, we here on the home front uh, are, are best to sort of count to 10, I think, before we react to anything that we see. Yeah. Uh, did you um, read much of the other 80? You said there were about 80 correspondents. How, how extensive? Did you, you know, there were, uh, did I read much of them? Initially, a couple of them are, are in the very early stages. There were some contributors to the, tri uh, to the Tribune, to the New York Times, um, to the Herald, uh, and, and to the London Times. They sort of fall away. I, I sort of followed the track of my guys, um, and they were, they would react competitively a little bit. But it was it became so apparent, partly because from the from this by the time the uh, Franco, uh, pardon me, they they bleed together, no pun intended. Um, uh, the 1877 war between Russia and Turkey. By the time that comes around, uh, these American reporters have have really set the pace, and the New York Herald is the paper of record for foreign affairs. And that's because its owner, a very, he's a major character in my book, he's a really great character, he's a complete reprobate and, 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 and a, a gin-swilling, uh, uh, you know, uh, libertine, uh, James Gordon Bennett, Jr., who uh, financed the ex expedition of Stanley to find uh, Livingston. Uh, but he was determined that he had the money, he threw money at the reporters, and they were very well paid uh, relative to what was out there, and uh, he made sure the Herald was always on top, and if it was beat in some way, he would, he would pay any amount to try to get the same story or to lift it or intercept it. It just was his way. The Herald was really the paper of record for this, uh, and the Daily News by the virtue of its partnership. Are you working on another book? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am. I, 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 I suppose like every, every college kid that thinks he can write, uh, you know, I, 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 I wanted to write novels, and I actually wrote a few uh, in the past. They're sort of my beloved illegitimate children, and um, uh, I'm going to write a, a novel next. Um, I, I might do it with, uh, somewhat with a historical bent to sort of try to make a bit of a transition, but I think I'm going to do uh, fiction if I can persuade my agent to take one on the chin, uh, and uh, we'll see. Uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's, I think I'm going to do that. That's the plan. Anything else? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Yes, yeah, sir. 
Was there much in the way of uh, corresponding casualties? Well, you know, mostly, it, it, that's, a, that's a really good question. And someone asked it the other night at another place where it's important, and it's sort of more, probably more clear in the book than I was here. These reporters aren't specifically, uh, at least by, um, by purpose, embedded, as we think of embedded reporters. They're sort of not going out with that squad on that recon mission. That's really not what they're, they're trying to get up on a hill and look over the plain where these great masses of armies are going to go at it. And when they do run into uh, fire, they almost take offense to it. McGain at one point realized that those Turks were actually shooting at me. And he feels sort of annoyed and irritated by that. <laughs> what was more perilous to them is uh, they, would, they would get ill because of um, the, the, the prison camps, the detainment camps, and the hospital wards were just these, these pestilential cesspools of, of, um, of disease. And many of the 80 simply had to go home. They weren't, you know, only very few were killed. They just had to go home. They were just uh, beaten down with, uh, with, with illness and parasites and all the things. And somehow McGahan and Millet got it out, although McGahan is physically shattered uh, by the end of the war. Uh, and that led to his death. Yeah. You know, I, 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 very little, and, and again, this is this is almost sort of. Um, uh, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this because some people say, "Have you ever? Were you a correspondent? Did you get shot at?" Actually, no, I didn't. But I spent a lot of time with their letters, so that's as close as I got. Um, but I didn't, for example, go to Bulgaria. I, I've been there before, but I didn't. But the uh, and anyone that's writing or has these kinds of ideas, I can, can only say that with a little bit of uh, uh, sort of curiosity and willing to think outside the box. You can find so much, frankly, through helpful librarians, of which this library is, is, is leads, leads the way. But for example, this, the war in, in, in Bulgaria, there was a lot of engagement between two, uh, in, on territory between two towns. Uh, Plev, Plevna, it was called at the time. It's now Pleven in Bulgaria. And 18 miles away is a smaller town called Lovcha. And there is, there's a lot of cavalry activity moving on this 18-mile road, a lot of supplies going back and forth. And, and I wasn't sure of the terrain. I couldn't really figure it out from the letters what it was like. And I said, geez, I don't want them to make it seem as if this was a, they could gallop free, free wheeling for 18 miles. For all I know, it's, a, it's thick woods or cliffs or what is it? So I didn't know, what am I going to do? And I was trying to pull it out of the letters and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't find mention of what it was like. So I go online and there's this crazy Bulgarian that put a camera on his motorcycle and rode with the camera uh, uh, down the entire road to show all his friends how fast he did it. And so you see the, the roads going, and he's bombing right through. So I'm getting the, the, all these glimpses of the whole territory around. And it was enough. I mean, it just gave me the idea, oh, OK, so it's sort of sparsely populated. There are some meadows. There are some mountains to the west. That was enough. So did I go there to see it? No. Did I cheat and find a way to see it? Yes. <laughs> yeah? Is there, um, speaking of that, that was almost the answer to my question, uh, virtual that you could you could go on as a virtual tour? You know, again, that would be an example. For example, I, I know I've been to Paris uh, a few times, but to, to fly back there to really get the lay of, the, of a particular street corner, maybe where something important happened, God bless the internet. I go on, I get a 360 view of the street corner. I can tilt up and take a look. And uh, for writing purposes, and then cross-referencing that with whatever they say in their letters or dispatches about what the architecture might have been or what, you know, were there alleys to hide in, I can sort of weave it together. And it, it was, again, it was sort of trying to use a craft of beginning with their words, beginning with what they remember, because that's really what I wanted it to be about. Uh, and then, uh, as I say, cross-referencing it with the reality as best I could find it um, through other books or through glimpses like that, through, you know, through new media, which is you know, a miraculous thing. Uh, yeah. Have you thought about maybe scripting this thing for Hollywood? <laughs> From your lips to God's ears, right. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, any producers here, I'm happy to uh, you know, uh, meet over at uh, Ernie's, and we'll talk about it. Um, uh, listen, it, uh, Obviously, I think it'd be ideal. I think it'd be fantastic on a five-year uh, mini-series, uh, you know, span on HBO. Um, uh, but uh, if that doesn't happen, you'll just have to read it and stick with that. What can I say? Yeah. Hi. You know, what struck me? I started reading your book, and uh, the impact it had on popular culture at the time. The, the charge of the light brigade. I mean, poetry, music, art. It was like the People magazine of its time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's. Uh, we've sort of followed an arc of history in, in, in my talk here, but I really begin, at least as, a, as sort of a precursor, the, the, uh, with William Howard Russell, who wrote the original dispatch of the Charge of the Light Brigade in 1854, uh, in which the British cavalry attacked the Russians in Crimea, and roughly 600 were decimated and less than 200 came back. And uh, William Howard Russell wrote that dispatch sitting up on a hill, sent it to Britain. It was an outrage, and it turned the people against that war. 
Um, and a month later, it was picked up uh, by, you know, the story was read by Alfred Lord Tennyson, who wrote the great poem, you know, the, and sort of transformed it from uh, uh, the literature of, of a news report to the literature of real poetry, and it has that great refrain: "There's not to make reply, there's but to uh, there's not to make reply, there's not to reason why, there's but to do and die." Uh, Russell begins that, and Russell is an interesting. Uh, this is how my mind works. I start to shoot off on this, but he, he provides a very interesting model to the later reporters who know all about him and revere him. Uh, and actually, he sh you know, he's still engaged. He's still reporting when they come on the scene. His piece about. Um, the Charge of the Light Brigade follows a very, if you, if, you, if, you look, if you break it down, it begins in the past tense, and he, he sets the stage, and he, and he tells how the, war, the order comes down from, the, uh, from the, uh, the general, the Lord Raglan, to advance nearer the enemy. And it's like that old game where you speak into a can at the end of a string, it's a, it's a different thing. By the time it gets to the, to the brigade, it's, it's, uh, it, was it advance nearer the enemy, or was it attack the enemy? So they get up and they decide they have to attack. Um, and when that happens in the story, Russell turns to present tense. So the, the story begins to accelerate now. He says, hey, then they're mounting up, they're beginning to ride, the Russian cannons. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a narrative trick to do that, to turn from past to present tense. And then uh, after the, the cataclysm happens and all these men are killed, and he's personally horrified in his piece that he writes that night, he goes back to the past tense in a very elegiac way. And it's a really nice arc, and you see that same pattern copied by so many reporters after that, where they'll, they'll set the stage in the past tense with a kind of a, just an expository way accelerate the narrative as their own excitement builds up, and, and likewise the readers, and then they'll take it down into a summing up. And so that's the, the technical model of what uh, uh, Russell provided. And the other model, which is very, very important, and he talked about it himself, where even though he was horrified and all these guys were horrified by things they saw, they also had detachment. And that's really, really important. And Russell would say, you know, I, I would go into hospitals and dying men would look at me and they would shake me out of my, he said, oh, such looks. They would shake him out of his voyeurism because he's sort of just looking at them and getting his impressions and he suddenly would see these men are dying in agony far from home. And um, uh, he would comment on his own detachment, almost lament it, but he said, this is what I do. And, and um, other reporters throughout comment on the same thing where they almost berate themselves and yet forgive themselves for this particular character trait of being able to somewhat step back, take it in, be horrified, and then put it down on paper the next day. Uh, it's, it's not something any, everyone can do. It's probably not something I could do, uh, and they do it, and Russell is their model. Um, it was about, he precedes them by about 20 years. Were the mobilities of these armies as the, uh, these various wars progressed through the latter half of the 1800s any different than the Civil War? Type? It's very similar. There's a, um, the one thing that makes the Prussians so formidable is they are very mobile. Uh, 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 Moltke was their was their great uh, sort of theoretician, and he used train trains to rather than march 100 miles. If there were trains, he would get uh, take the train 80 miles, even if it was in, and then march. He did a lot of things which were very innovative at the time, and France was completely unable to cope with all that. And the, his particular flexibility also in using cavalry, he, he had the great line which I use, that, that cavalry, he doesn't like it as, a, as an attack mechanism, he wants cavalry, <coughs> cavalry to simply be everywhere all the time. And so it, that begins to come to the fore, but really there is a, a lot of parallel uh, between, and the, and the reporter's comment about something that I mentioned, that these are, these are Shilohs, these are Gettysburgs happening uh, far away in these foreign, these foreign fields. Um, and really, it's, and this has been written about by better military historians than me, but it, it's, it's that period where the technology of killing, the accuracy of the weapons, and how often they can be repeat fired, how maintenance uh, uh, capable they are, uh, has far exceeded the tactical changes. So they're still using tactics of, say, the early 1800s, which is to march across a field, and, and yet you have now all of this ordnance uh, being leveled at them, which actually can hit the target. And this is why the, the casualties just explode. In fact, Millet, with his, with his great way of writing, he has, he has a great way of saying, he says, the poor Russians, when they're fighting the Turks, and the Russia you know, has the better army and whatnot, but Turks have the better weapons. It's an, actually the Turks use a, an American weapon, the Martini Peabody. And the Martini Peabody is accurate at 2,000 yards. Okay? The Russians, and this, you know, hundreds of thousands of Russian infantry, their rifles are accurate at 600 yards. So they are told by their commanders, you have to walk to within 600 yards, and then you're allowed to shoot. You get one shot, and then you have to attack with bayonets. So you've got all that time, you've got the enemy from 2,000 yards in, you've got them firing at you quite safely. 
until you get to within 600 yards. And then you get your one shot, and then you have this, this a huge block of men essentially running up the hill into these, 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 these Turkish emplacements. And, and Millet, thinking of the Russians, he goes, this tries the nerve. That's, what, that's how he put it, you know, and, and indeed it does. So, um, uh, yes? Can you talk about this de detachment? Was that different than the kind of coverage that Americans were reading during the Civil War? I think, that, I think the psychological model is very much the same. Uh, there was Smalley, whom we mentioned, he's, one, he's first and later in his career, he begins to sort of analyze journalism from the point of view of a profession and what people bring to it and what are the traits that, that make for good reporters and what are the strains and, um, and adaptations that reporters have to uh, experience to, to do their job well under these obviously trying circumstances. And detachment is one of them. And you see it in the Civil War, but nobody really writes about it. They don't, they're not really conscious of it, they just obviously do it. Uh, there's a, I don't have it in my book, but there's a very famous um, story of a Civil War reporter, I wish I could remember his name, is it Creelman? I don't think so, who uh, was a reporter and his son was a soldier. And he writes, and his son is killed, and he writes his uh, d uh, dispatch with the body of his dead son next to him, writing his dis dispatch about the war, and never mentions his son in the dispatch. He writes about the events of the day. Um, and that's a true story, and I, it's been written about in many books about Civil War reporters. Like there's one called um, The Bohemian Brigade. There's one called Blue and Gray and Black and White. They're very good books, and they have those kind of scenes. I was trying to sort of set a different scene so I could get off to new territory in Europe uh, with my guys. A lot of great questions. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we've... They're ready to close out the joint here. I just want to thank you all so much for coming. Uh, very touched by, by you know, uh, your presence. So thank you very much. <laughs>